I'd first of all like to welcome everyone to webinar number three in the PERSA Water Literacy Series. Um, my name is Rod Carr, I'm a director with Miles and Jacob Associates, and I'm pleased to be your host for the webinar today. Um, as you can see from the title page here, today's webinar is on the coming water year, 2020-21 irrigation season, and looking at uh, opportunities for you to diversify water holdings um, is a key theme for this webinar. We'll also be across the webinar hearing from a range of other presenters. Uh, I'd like to start by doing an acknowledgement of country. Uh, as host of this webinar, I firstly need to acknowledge the traditional owners. As this meeting includes representatives from other parts of the country, it is important all of us to reflect, acknowledge and pay respects to traditional owners and their nations of the entire River Murray system. I acknowledge and acknowledge that the traditional owners and their nations of the River Murray have a deep and ongoing cultural, social, environmental, spiritual and economic connection to their lands and waters. And on behalf of all of us joining in the webinar today, I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders joining us here today. Uh, I'd like to now do some brief introductions uh, to the presenters that you're going to be hearing from across the next two hours and then we'll start stepping into some of the detail. So uh, from Mars and Jacob, you can see here we've got three people who you're going to be hearing from. Uh, first of all, myself, Rod Carr, Simo Turvenen, who is a principal with Mars and Jacob, and Stuart McLaughlin, who's a senior consultant with Mars and Jacob. Um, we're also really pleased to be having Francis Sines from the Department of Water, Environment and Water, sorry, I get tripped up on the name changes, from the Department for Environment and Water joining us. Uh, Francis is team leader with the Water Licensing Branch. And we've also got Megan Taylor, who's the Water and Administration Manager with Renmark Irrigation Trust, who will be joining us today as well. Uh, I'd also like to just, uh, express our thanks to the team at PERSA who provided a lot of assistance in the preparation of the content and a lot of guidance and advice in putting this together. Uh, in particular to Rachel Kelly, Program Manager of the River Murray Sustainability and to Tasha McGregor, Support Recovery Facilitator. This webinar is being recorded and so to have the previous two webinars. Uh, when the webinar is up online, uh, you as a participant will receive an email saying it's now available. So if you want to uh, re-watch it, if there's anything you want to have a think about as part of it and have another look at it, um, please feel free. If you've got someone who you know was unable to attend today, but you think might be interested, please let them know. Um, and if you're interested in having a look at the previous two webinars, then jump onto the PERSA website and you'll be able to see that there. Um, there will be opportunities and we really hope that you do make the most of this to, to ask questions. Um, you'll be able to see uh, a Q&A tab on your uh, control panel in Zoom. And we basically ask you to, to jump in there and ask questions. Um, if you've got a question for a particular person or presenter, it's always helpful to us if you mention their name. Um, if it's of more of a broader policy nature, um, we may take that on notice and take that to the team at due and be looking to get back to that, back to you on that after the webinar is completed. Um, but we'll endeavour to answer as many of your questions as we possibly can over the course of the webinar. Um, so that's basically the intro um, and now we're going to step into, I just want to give a quick overview as to what we're going to cover in this program. So here's the outline. We've basically broken the presentation into two parts. In part one, which will uh, take about the first hour to complete, um, we're going to give you an update on the 2020-21 water year and looking beyond. Um, and really what's changed since the last webinar in May. We're then going to look at preparing and planning for the rest of the water year. And we'll look at some options beyond 2021 with a bit of a practical look and some case studies uh, looking into interstate trading options and diversification options. Um, at the end of that session, we've got a Q&A session. So um, as we're going, if you've got questions, 
send them to us. Um, but also at the end there, we encourage you to, to ask questions and we'll basically work our way through the questions um, and seek to answer as many as we can. Um, in the second part of it, we're gonna be talking about trading water and how does it happen in practice? And really pleased to have Francis joining us for this session. And Francis is gonna uh, talk us through some of the issues that can arise um, where trading is concerned and talk us through some of the practicalities of it. Uh, also really pleased to have Megan Taylor who will be joining all of us as part of panel discussion, but particularly Megan and I will do some leading commentary to the panel and then we'll open up to a Q&A session at the end where all of the panel, uh, all of the presenters will be available basically to answer your questions at that point in time. So I'm going to now step into the first part of the webinar, which is the market update and outlook for 2020-21, and, and really with a focus on what's changed since May. And I guess there's a lot of good news. Um, so what we've actually seen since May is quite an important recovery in the system. And we've seen above average inflows into the storages, which is really helping storage levels to recover. Um, and we're in quite a good position now, particularly when we compare ourselves to the same time last year. I guess it's also worth noting that we saw a lot of water carried over, uh, estimates of around 60% more than the previous year carried over. There's been some supplementary access to water in New South Wales, and we've seen some limited demand and some trading occurring. Prices have come down quite significantly. Um, and that's the good news uh, for mine as well, that this supply demand relationship uh, often leads to this reaction in the market. We've got an improved supply. We've also got uh, an improved outlook. So the bomb forecast is indicating a wetter winter and spring period, uh, which is basically introducing a degree of positive sentiment into the market. Uh, you also see there's been a little bit of an uptick in prices since they uh, reached their lowest point over the last couple of weeks. Um, and look, an explanatory of that is there's actually, from what we can observe, quite a few forwards that were traded and agreed last year at last year's prices. And they're contributing to some of this uptick um, in prices in the market. But overall, we're seeing prices significantly below where they were at the same time last year. The allocation outlook in May, uh, this is what we were talking about based on the outlook in February. And we could see a fair degree of risk that under a dry condition, we're looking at a level that would be below 1920 um, and well below the 10 year average. How's it looking now? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the outlook has improved and really quite significantly. So this is the allocation outlook now, and we can see that we're now got dry sitting above the 1920 water year outcome and under average inflow conditions, we're actually getting very close to the 10 year average. So it's a much more positive outlook than what we had at this time last year and even uh, in, back in, in May when we did this last webinar. So look, that's, that's a really pleasing development um, from our perspective because it means there's more water in the market um, and it's led to softening of prices, which presents new opportunities for people to access water out of the market. So all set for the season ahead, and I'm gonna now hand over the baton to Stuart McLaughlin uh, who's coming online now um, to talk us through all set for the season ahead. Over to you, Stuart. Thanks, Rod. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for the third workshop um, as part of uh, Purse's Water Market Literacy Program. Uh, as Rod said, my name's Stuart McLaughlin. Um, and yes, I don't know, my little profile picture looks a lot different now with my COVID haircut. Uh, for the first part, for the rest of part one, uh, we have quite a bit to cover in 35 minutes, so I'm sure we get through it all. 
Um, these slides, as Rod said, will be provided in a recording, will be provided at the end for you to review. Um, I'm going to start with a few considerations for the start of the season, carryover and account management. Uh, and this will follow with a look at uh, interstate leases and entitlement purchases and some things you should be um, thinking about when looking at these products. Um, and a brief example, we've got some um, case studies uh, and a brief example of the cost of these two products. So carryover. It's a, it's a bit of a, 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 tricky, a, a tricky thing to get your head around. Um, so, you know, did, did you carry over any water for your uh, South Australian entitlement? So, as Rod said, the SA class three allocation is now 70%, 77%. And outlooks, uh, the allocation outlooks indicating that it's probably going to reach 100% uh, allocation by around October. And what this means is that the water you've carried over will not be available for use uh, in the 2020-21 water season. Um, the volume um, above 100% will effectively go into your rollover account. And we've got a little graphic here showing that. So the maximum carryover is 20% of your entitlement. So we've got 77 now. The, the 20%, it will go over, once it gets to 100%, it will go uh, in, 20% will go into a rollover account. And if allocation is again triggered in the following year, so next year in 2021, with, with the April announcement, this announcement is less than 50%, then the rollover volume can be credited to your water account in the following water year if the allocation is less than 80%. So as we can see here in the, uh, um, in the graph, we've got the start of season two, got a 50% allocation announcement in April. Then in, year, uh, in water year two, um, if the allocation is less than 80%, and this is sometimes usually around September, this this call was made when, when there's a good indication that the um, allocation for that water year is not going to get to 100%. Um, then the rollover, the rollover water, it's important to note, it's not actually available for use and it's not tradable until it's converted back into a carryover allocation onto your uh, water account. Uh, next, Rob. Okay, so carryover and parking couple of other considerations. So you parked water interstate, a um, few things to think about for going to this season. Uh, have you already returned the water to your South Australian account? Um, what were the contract details? Um, if you parked it, you know, the date of return, when will it happen? Um, you know, some considerations for uh, interstate um, parking is, you know, particularly for Victorian entitlements, that would be the risk of spill. Um, is there a risk that you may not get your water returned? You know, the current uh, Victorian Murray system, the risk of spill is uh, 60%. Um, and the other thing to think about is, is trade restrictions. We can see a little snapshot here of the our water flow platform in the market overview section, um, particularly for South Australian irrigators. The Barmer Chokes closed, um, Goulburn to Murray IVT limits closed, as well as the Murrumbidgee uh, IVT trade out um, is also closed. So those three things need to be um, considered as well as the spill risk uh, when you're returning your um, interstate parked water uh, for this year. Next. Um, water account management. So two particular things for South Australian irrigators is it's important not to exceed your site use limit or overuse as penalties will apply. So your site use, the combined volume of announced allocation, carryover, uh, parked water, forward water, bought temporary water, you know, this may exceed your site use limit. But it's important to note that it's not as an issue as long as you don't use more than your site use limit. It's, there's no penalty if the water is just sitting on your account ready to use, it's only if you use it. Um, and overuse. So River Murray, South Australian River Murray uh, water users must also ensure that they have not used more water than is available on their account by the end of each quarter. Um, uh, penalty uh, for excess water use will apply if you'd use more water than the volume of water available on your account. Um, at the close of this the first quarter, which is 30th of September 2020. And if we look here, we can see some of the rates 
uh, penalty rates for exceeding site use limit can be uh, up to $740 per megalitre, million kilolitres there. Um, and these are the, 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 these are the penalty rates for from Q4 um, in the last 40 year. And my understanding is that the uh, rates for Q1 this year should be gazetted um, around mid-August. Next. Right. So water budgeting, um, we're at the beginning of the season and it's good to you know, think about a few things about what, what, what your water use is going to be over this year and how can you best um, manage your water portfolio to ensure you get um, the best out of it. So you know, four key questions we're really thinking of here is how much water will I need to use this quarter? And it's important to think about under different climatic conditions. Um, Rod spoke about, you know, at the beginning of May in our first webinar, um, we had, you know, quite different outlooks, allocation outlooks, um, as we do uh, compared to now. So it's different to, it's important to think about, you know, dry, average and wet conditions and what under those scenarios you might use. Um, how much allocation water? will I have available? Um, is that sort of what's your supply going to be for the year? Um, is there any anticipated surplus or deficit? You know, am I at risk of needing more water than I have? Uh, and it's important to, to, to have this um, understanding because you can, you can then develop a trading strategy. So you can go into the market um, now or plan ahead of purchasing forward water or something like that. So you, you're not stuck um, in the peak water in season um, purchasing water when prices are potentially high. Um, and then how much water can I use? You know, budgeting actual versus, you know, sorry, budget versus actual water. Is it greater than my site use? Do I need to consider going to the market to purchase more site use so then I, I can actually get through this season and um, um, use, use the water that I have? Um, just a quick note, as part of the water literacy program, um, PERSA and Mars and Jacob have developed um, a set of fact sheets um, there'll be four fact sheets um, released after this webinar, as well as a water um, balance checklist. And that's just going to go through these questions in a little bit more detail um, and, 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 and a few other questions to help you help stimulate your thinking around what should I budget and what should I consider in each of the, each of the four quarters of the water year. Next. So the next part um, is going to look at um, two products. So we're going to look at uh, entitlement leases uh, and sorry, we're going to look at interstate entitlement leases and uh, entitlement purchase uh, and we're going to have a couple of case studies. So Rod, next. So we're just going to briefly uh, retouch on uh, market connectivity. We've spoken about this in the last couple of webinars but it's important just to cover um, to provide some context. Um, so in the Southern Connected, allocation can be traded across catchments uh, and state boundaries subject to trading rules and limits. And this essentially increases the market size and gives South Australian irrigators access to interstate entitlements and allocations that um, have a range of different characteristics in terms of their carryover, etc. For a little bit of comparison here, we can see the South Australian Class 3 entitlements on issue, 608 gigalitres. Getting to Victoria, you've got 900. New South Wales, 11, high security, you've got 164, and then general security, you've got 1,800 gigalitres available. And that little graph there is just showing the, uh, the back end of our water flow platform and, and how the uh, trade limits are adjusted for um, when looking at different buy and sell listings. Next. Okay, so as we discussed under the current trading rules, Temporary water can always be traded to South Australia from Victorian zone 6B and 7 and New South Wales zones 11 without limits. This means that buying or leasing entitlements from these zones comes without delivery risks, that is not being able to get the water returned back to you. Um, and so it's important to know that in other zones, there may be restricted restrictions. And we touched on a few of these at the beginning. And the, the, the key ones are the Barmer choke, so from above to below, um, the Victorian, I, uh, sorry, the Goldman IVT um, and the Murrumbidgee IVT. Next. And just as a little bit of uh, demonstration here, we've got just a screenshot of our uh, water flow platform. 
Um, and here we are looking at, um, I've got uh, SA Murray as my zone I've selected and I've just gone in and, and, and looked at what the cell listings are. So I'm gonna look at some buying some water. I'm gonna see what the cell listings are. And here we can see from SA Murray, I've got these three um, zones available to me and it takes into account where you are and it will display only results based on the uh, current trade limits. Next. So connectivity really underpins water delivery to South Australia. So how do I actually get water to my property in South Australia if I own or lease an interstate uh, water? So for this water, if you've purchased permanent water, you can through an allocation trade um, or you can get it through um, establishing interstate tag. So the benefit of tagging versus an allocation trade is that you only have to pay a one-off tagging fee. After that, you do not have to pay uh, a transfers fees as you would with allocation trades. However, you need to order the water each time you want to use the tagged entitlement, but there's no fees with uh, ordering water. So you know, it's, it's, it's a useful um, function to look into. If you've leased water, really the only uh, way is through uh, an allocation trade. And obviously you can lease water, you can lease, uh, not interstate, but you can lease uh, an SA entitlement as well. In that case, water will be credited to your account automatically. In terms of applications, we're gonna to touch on that next and, and look at you know, what sort of applications are involved in this trading process. Um, allocation trades need to be lodged in terms of interstate. Allocation trades uh, need to be lodged both with due um, and the interstate water authority. Um, and potentially with the IAOs or um, if, you, uh, if that's involved in the uh, trade. Next. Okay, so we're just gonna go through a couple of um, trade examples here. It's important to note that um, these are not necessarily all the applications you personally have to submit if you're, if you're part of a trust then um, the trust will assist you with these trades, but we're just gonna cover off what, a brief overview of what some of these trades look like. So. Here we've got a trade between South Australian River Murray private diverter uh, and an interstate private diverter and it essentially has five steps. Um, the buy and sellers matched either via an intermediary, a broker or through a direct agreement with your parties. And then step two and three, the trade application is lodged with due and the interstate authority. And then four and five, once approved, if approved, the trade is recorded to the South Australian and interstate water registry. Next. So example two, a trade between a trust irrigator, CRT or RIT, um, and an interstate private diverter. And it involves a few more steps. First, we've got, again, buy and seller is matched um, via an intermediary or through the trust. Two, a trade application is lodged with the trust. Three and four, trade application is lodged with due and the interstate authority. And then four, five, and six, if approved, trade is recorded to the IAO, um, to the trust accounting system register and both water registers. So that's three applications. Next. And the last one, so this is a trade between a trust, um, a South Australian trust, CRT, ROT, um, and in an interstate IAO member. So it might be Murray Irrigation, for example, and this involves the most steps. Again, buy and seller is matched. We then have a trade application. It's lodged with the trust and the interstate IIO. Then a trade uh, application is lodged with due and the interstate authority. And then the final four, if approved, these are recorded with the trust, the IAO, and the state reg both the state registers. So there's, you need to, there's, there's four applications in this. Um, next. So just a brief overview. Um, Water delivery to South Australia via allocation trades. It contains multiple steps and can require multiple applications and approvals. There are There is help out there. Um, water brokers or intermediaries, they can certainly assist you with the trade applications and they can provide a, a full service handling all the paperwork. You can also do it, uh, alternatively you can do it yourself and there's help. Um, we'll touch on these processes later with uh, a due guest speaker and they can uh, answer any of your questions and help you through that process. Trust members can get assistance from their trusts and private averters, as I said, can seek guidance from um, the department. 
So next. So an entitlement lease. So as we said at the beginning, we're going to touch on lease, uh, entitlement lease and um, permanent uh, purchases. So an entitlement lease may be a beneficial option uh, for you to consider um, going forward in terms of diversifying your water portfolio. So an entitlement holder, seller or lease, or they transfer, transfer complete access to the entitlement to the buyer or leasee for a specified period of time. And this is generally three to um, five years. At the end of that period, the access to the entitlement returns back to uh, the leasee, the lease or the seller. Typical contract features, you've got entitlement, tight and location, length of the lease, and your price increase CPI may be there. Um, responsibility for ongoing entitlement fees, which we're going to touch on um, in a little bit, and how and when the allocation is transferred. Um, might be through a separate allocation or might be a term transfer. And the benefits. For buyers, leasing water provides um, water and financial security by guaranteeing access to a water entitlement for a known period compared to buying water entitlements outright. Leases are a less capital uh, intensive alternative uh, for water users uh, and, it, and it can mitigate some of that risk. For sellers, entitlement leases, it provides a secure income uh, for the lease term while retaining the potential for the longer term asset appreciation and capital gains. Next. So we've just got a little bit of a uh, bit of data here, the popularity of entitlement leases. So this is just South Australian Victorian um, turn transfers and we can certainly see an increase from 2013, 14 up until the 2019, 20 water year. It's important that this graph only includes term transfers in Victoria. Anecdotally, more leases are now written via allocation trades, but this just shows you that they're, they're becoming more and more popular. We've got the percentage of the market on the right hand axis there. Um, and we're, we're certainly uh, increasing. Next. So we've, as we've touched on previously, access to interstate water for, from South Australian irrigated perspective has significant benefits. Purchasing an entitlement in Victoria or New South Wales can give a greater water security and improve carryover capacity. So we can see just in that little table there, we've got all the different uh, zones and their uh, high reliability and low reliability and their, and their, and their uh, carryover capacity. So carryover capacity for Vic and high and low and gen, New South Wales general, and that, that is, sorry, New South Wales general security entitlements. And that's greater than it is in South Australia, particularly New South Wales high security entitlements. They received 95 to 97% 90 allocation on 1 July in all but extreme, uh, extremely dry years, such as the millennium drought. So there is some, there is, there is a greater water security increase capacity in, in looking at interstate products. Next. So I've just got a, um, a little snapshot here of the our water flow platform, um, permanent purchases is still a good option as, as opposed to leasing, just an outright permanent purchase of an entitlement. However, it does require, it does require significant capital. As we can see here, we're in the report and outlook section. We're looking at permanent water. We've selected zone 12, um, River Murray. Um, we've got the date range there going back to 2015. So as part of the, the, of the free account, you can go back five years and look at volume weighted average price over that time. And we can certainly see there's been a sharp increase um, up until 2015, 17, 18, started to increase 2019 and we're now um, up to six or seven thousand dollars. Next. So what are the costs associated with leasing owning entitlement? Um, so these are 2021 fees. There are both administrative and transactional uh, and ongoing fixed fees associated. So ongoing fixed fees, these are payable for each megalitre of entitlement you own. Uh, there may also be an annual account or service fee, for example in Victoria, $119 per account in Victoria. And it's important that you know, these fees are separate to using water in South Australia. 
There's no usage fees for South Australian River Murray and Tartum. It's all water traded into SA and used in SA. IOs are a bit different, also need to think about delivery rights. Transferring fees for um, as part of an allocation trade, so getting the water interstate back into South Australia, um, $277 per trade for South Australia, Victoria 47, New South Wales 49, plus if you're going interstate, there's an added, added on fee. And these varies between, and fee varies between um, different, different brokers and service providers, and, and you can see that on it. Um, when looking at uh, the water flow platform, we've got some of those indi indicative costs for you. And just there, the little table, we've got the fixed fees uh, for each of the areas per, uh, uh, for, it, for when you own the entire what the fixed fees are per megalitre. Next. So what are the risks um, with leasing and owning an entitlement? So in order to manage a risk. It's essential to know what types of risks are associated with these products. So you can be best informed when, when going into state and looking at these products. So one, got an allocation risk. Will the entitlement yield sufficient allocation for your requirements? Um, and that's really important. Delivery risk, trade limits, if it's in a particular area above the choke, um, Murrumbidgee or Goulburn, uh, you need to be aware of those different IVTs. So when you call on your water, you can actually get it. For Victorian uh, and less so New South Wales, you've got a, a spill risk. So this can be partly mitigated by smart use of carryover capacity. Um, ensure that it's carried over in those zones where you don't have uh, any trade limits and a price risk. Always present in some shape or form, but depends on the frame of mind. For example, buying perm water at $7,000 per megalitre and then temp stays at $50 for five years in a row, it's something that needs to be weighed up. Next. So what, looking at the, these different uh, uh, products and, and their risks, you know, see allocation risk, they both have, for both in permanent entitlement trade and an entitlement lease, they've both got allocation risk. Delivery risk, they've both got that acquiring entitlements, they may be subject to um, many trade limits, can be spill risk, uh, in Victoria. Price risk, more so in the entitlement lease. If leases can lock in the price, but the price risk is associated with paying more than the eventual spot market price. So we're going to touch on an example later. You, 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 you've rented and you, you know, you've leased an entitlement and the allocation for that may be only 50% and the, the um, sort of the, the levelised cost of that entitlement and that allocation may be more than what the current temporary market, but we'll go through that example. Um, risk bearer, one's on for permanent entitlement trade, that's on the buyer, entitlement lease, uses a bit of hybrid, and counterparty risk. The counterparty risk could eventuate to the buyer in a situation where sort of the bank refuses to discharge an encumbrance or a mortgage. So there's some things to think about um, when you've got an impermanent, a permanent entitlement trade. Next. So, couple of case studies, we've just got two here. Um, we also had a couple of case studies in the last uh, webinar, so make sure you check out those as well. Um, next. So case study one, we've got a grower looking to diversify their water portfolio. And again, we're gonna stay on um, entitlement leases and, and permanent. Um, the theme is uh, gonna be a permanent entitlement and uh, leases. And so entitlement prices, although they're softening, Outright ownership still requires uh, alternative, uh, still requires capital. So is an entitlement lease uh, a good alternative? And the key here is you need to factor in trade limits, getting your allocation water delivered to your SA account, especially in consideration with you know, Goulburn above the choke and Murrumbidgee entitlements. Allocation yield, how much allocation are the entitlements likely to yield year on year? In leases can be three to five years, so you can be, um, you can have that entitlement for quite some time. New South Wales high security entitlements, for example, have historically provided good allocation um, in all but the extreme uh, water, extreme uh, dry years. Carryover capacity, New South Wales high security, well, the one can't carry over, but the others have varying uh, carryover capacity that um, are better than you know, the South Australian uh, entitlement. Uh, fees and charges, 
as we've touched on, there was a range of fees and charges for not only holding, but trading those, trading and allocation um, from a, a lease or a permanent purchase to your South Australian account. Next. So entitlement leases, they give access to entitlement characteristics without the capital costs. And some considerations apply um, as with the entitlement purchase. Um, and we've just touched on a range of those, the deliverability, um, how much entitlement you're going to receive. And leases are generally three or more years. So considerations of what the alternative is, is the average water price. So considering what the average water price is going to be over that time. And we'll look at some of those figures in the next slide. So here we go, we've got some calculation examples and these are just indicative. So lease prices late last year were around $350 a megalitre for zone seven, high reliability in Victoria, and about $500 per megalitre for zone 11, high security in New South Wales. And this is for a three to five year lease term. Example one, so you've leased 100 megalitres of zone seven. Assume this year's allocation is 48% dry scenario you will receive 48, you will have 48 megalitres available. You've paid for the full 100 megalitres, i.e. 350 times the 100 megalitres, that's 35,000. The effective dollars per megalitre you've paid is the 35,000 divided by 48, because that's the megalitres you have available based on the allocation. And that comes to $729 a megalitre for that allocation water. And it's, so that, when you consider that against the current spot price, quite a bit higher. Example two, uh, you've leased 100 megalitres again of zone 11 high security. Assume this year's water allocation is 97%. You'll have 97 megalitres available. You paid for the full 100, i.e. $500 a megalitre times 150,000. The effective dollars per megalitre you've paid is 50,000 divided by the 97 megalitres and that's $515 a megalitre. Still quite a bit higher than the current spot price now, but if you consider the spot price um, during the peak around December, January last year, up to $800 in some cases. For reference, we've got here the Murray-Darling below the choke, the VWAP, so the volume weighted average price, since 2010 has been $181 a megalitre. Um, but the VWAP over the last four years, 307. So we can see over the recent years, it's sort of, um, the, the average has, has gone up and we've got a little table there, 2016-17, the VWAP, quite a wet year, uh, $71 up until 2019-20, $654 for the volume weighted average in the last water year. Next. So case study two, uh, we're going to look at permanent purchase here. Historical calculation example. Uh, so an SA irrigator buying 100 megalitres of zone 7 again uh, in 2015-16 versus buying 100 megalitres from the allocation water market. What's going to be the difference? Some of the assumptions we've used here, allocation water can be bought from the spot market at annual VWAP prices, so we haven't taken into the fluctuation over the year. Both irrigators use 100 megalitres of water per annum in South Australia, and it excludes broker fees and commissions. So we've got here purchase price, $3,000 per megalitre, 100 megalitres, $300,000. Set up an interstate tag, for example, one-off fee, 277. It's a Victorian entitlement. So as we've touched on before, Victorian has a fixed cost estimated over the four years, about $540. So 2019-20 temp price, we're looking at about $22,000. So in total, over the for buying the permanent, you're looking at about $323,000 in the total cost. And if we consider having holding that entitlement from 2015-16 up until now, um, prices you know, are around uh, $6,500. So we can, we can consider a net capital gain there on that entitlement of around $350,000. And we can see here, here we go to B down the bottom there, if you consider just instead of buying the permanent entitlement, you're just buying allocation water. Uh, over that time, total cost about $131,000. Next. So 
bit of conclusion here. We've touched on those two case studies. We've looked at entitlement leases. We've looked at permanent purchase. Now, divine interstate, uh, diversifying water holding with interstate water can provide uh, significant uh, benefits to SA irrigators. Um, it provides opportunities to access entitlements with a range of different characteristics from improved carryover capacity and allocation or allocation uh, yield. However, these things need to be considered. The cost of the products, purchase price, purchase cost and ongoing fees, which one's right for you, which one fits, fits your uh, water portfolio. Deliverability, can you securely get that water to your SA account or are there trade limits that are impeding on this? Entitlement characteristics, such as the allocation yield, the carryover capacity, or if it's a Victorian risk of spill. Need to do your own research and there's a lot of good information out there and the fact sheets will help you with, the, um, the, that, uh, with that research. Uh, and the analysis in relation to what's the best fit for you and your requirements. And also the broader availability outlook. Is there a shift towards a wetter pattern? We saw 2016, quite a wet year, tending towards the 2019, quite a dry. You know, that's three years we've seen quite a big change in, in the price from the $71 VWAP to $600. So those things need to be considered and it's good information out there. And, as, and, and so, as I've touched on, it is pivotal to access reliable and inf independent uh, information to support your decision making. So, and as part of these workshops, we've got the fact sheets and the water balance checklist, um, which will go through some of these questions to help you uh, think about some of these considerations. Next. So I'm gonna pass back to Rod. Uh, we're going to move on to part two. So before we do, Stuart, there's been a couple of questions um, that have come through thus far, and I'm just sort of jumping into the chat and um, making sure we pick those up at this point in time. Um, I think Simo is also here for some questions. So Simo, you should also be online and feel free to unmute at this stage as well. Maybe we'll direct this first one to you, Simo, as well. So. There's a question that's come in saying if carryover water um, was not available in the second year, what happens to it after that? Yeah, so basically, uh, if uh, in year two, uh, uh, the SA carryover is, is not available, i.e. The, the early April announcement uh, for minimum allocations is greater than 50%, Yes, it will mean that the rollover water uh, will not be uh, available that year. So basically, you won't get access to the water you carried over uh, uh, from year one to year two. Uh, and yeah, there was a, there was a follow-up question: uh, Where does this water go? Is it socialized to South Australian accounts? Uh, in a way, yes. So that, that water, it's not lost entirely, albeit you will lose direct access to it, yes. But uh, my understanding is that that water, the role of a water, will, it will contribute to future carryover ability as these rollover volumes will still be underpinned by the deferred water South Australia is holding in the shared uh, Murray storages. Uh, obviously, there are separate account management rules uh, for that deferred water uh, as they can hold for, for private, private carryover. But uh, my understanding is that that water still continues to contribute to the future carryover ability. Great, thanks Simo. Um, now we'll do a couple more questions, but we've got five minutes and then we're going to um, turn to Francis, who is our, our next presenter. Um, so I've got another question here around the cost or value of water sold um, and what are the best options? Um, someone's asking about water quality. I guess water quality is something that individuals need to consider um, and we're 
really focusing on, on river water as part of this, as part of recycled water. Um, so I might take that one on notice um, rather than trying to move into water quality because we've got very much a focus on the river at this stage. Um, there was a question earlier around buying space in zone seven to park water or lease um, and thinking about that as a strategy. Um, Stuart, I wondered if you wanted to jump in on this one. Yes, there we go, sorry. Uh, buying space in zone seven to park or leasing. So, you know, as, as we've just touched on there, two very uh, different strategies. Leasing, uh, present really three to five year strategy as opposed to um, buying uh, space in zone seven just to park and, pick and and retrieve the water the next year. So, you know, a couple of things you need, you know, parked water you might consider. Um, risk bill if it's Victoria um, and trade limits. Whilst leasing, you, uh, you need to consider the cost per megalitre based on the allocation return. Um, and we touched on you know, a couple of those in the last slide. There's another one here which is saying, can you determine if you are paying too much for water? Um, Sim, I wonder if you jump in on that one. Yeah, sure, Rod. Uh, I suppose there are multiple angles to that. Like, uh, it all depends on the individual's capacity to pay what is considered uh, too much. Uh, and obviously that comes down to, uh, if you're an irrigator, the crop you're growing and, and the margins um, you have for your operations. So obviously, if, if you know uh, the average cost of water per megalitre uh, exceeds your your net margins on, on an ongoing basis, obviously, then the conclusion would be that you're paying too much for your water. But I, I suppose in the water market, uh, it's it's based on supply and demand, and closely monitoring and tracking the market movements, you can stay on top of things and uh, at least assess what is the fair market price at the moment so that you will know not to pay a uh, top dollar uh, or more than the, the prevailing market price. I think the other thing on that Simo and, and for everyone to think about as well is that if something looks really cheap, in the market, um, there's, in my observation, usually a really good reason for that. And we've talking about, we've spoken about some of those reasons already, um, such as IVT risks and the like. So um, if you see something in the market that is significantly different, you know, do some further research to understand why that's the case. And there can be a range of reasons for that, depending on what is the status of the market at this point in time. And I guess one of the things we showed before is that the rules engine in the back of Waterflow can, can give you some assistance with that because we've got those trading limits um, programmed in. And there's a subsequent question there around sort of why is it cheaper to park water in Golden IVT? Um, and for mine, you know, that's, really linked to the, the risk associated with getting that water out of Goulburn um, and getting it delivered elsewhere in the Murray or either Vic or New South Wales or even down into South Australia. Um, and so that traditionally leads to um, a higher risk attributed to it. And there's also risk of spill in that area as well that needs to be factored into consideration. Um, maybe one more question and then I'll move to Francis. We do have a couple of Q&A sessions programmed into the agenda. So we will come back and, and look to answer some more of these questions. But um, strategies to minimise financial impact of quarter, quarterly water balancing has also come up uh, as part of the question set that I can see. So I wondered if maybe Simo, you could talk about strategies that could be used to 
um, minimise that financial impact. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Rod. Like, well, as we have touched on uh, earlier in the presentation, uh, budgeting and, and preparing like a water budget, it's, it's really important. So, and we have developed some resources to, to assist you with that. So basically uh, uh, mapping all the debits and credits in terms of uh, water that will be available for you. And then your anticipated use uh, at uh, different points in, in the season, it's it's really important uh, for you to determine if you're likely to be over or under. Uh, for instance, uh, at the end of each quarter uh, during the, the water year, so that's pivotal, you know, to know where you likely to to be at. Obviously, you know, things can change. You might get a good look of rain, which will reduce your uh, your uh, water requirements, uh, but also there might be a heat wave, so you might actually use more than you anticipated. But still, you know, preparing a budget and updating that, I think that's that's pivotal. But also uh, looking into the market and different products that are available, uh, you know, it, it can reduce your risk uh, of paying peak prices significantly. So looking at where the market is going uh, and also the, the alternatives as we flagged here, you know, if not, you know, permanent purchase or, or in time and lease, but also forwards and, you know, uh, and also carry a parking to, to maximize your, the available water you, you might have uh, within the water season. So looking into doing a research, looking into different products, what they can offer to you, what is the cost per megaliter for, for different products and, yeah, it's just uh, hedging your bets, really. You know, we, uh, the team of, of this webinar is diversifying. So, which in a broad sense means that just um, widen your horizons, just look into different options and and then uh, you're in a better position to make an informed decision and, and manage that risk. Thanks, Simo. Um, so I'm now going to actually uh, hand over to Francis. I'm just going to have to end the share in a second and, and get Francis's presentation up and running. So it'll just take me a second and then I'll do an introduction. But Francis is going to be talking about transfer applications, meter reads, application lodgements with due and the like, and the things that you need to consider. So just give me a second and I'll get your presentation up and running, Francis. And now we should be up and running. Um, and I'd like to welcome Frances. So Frances uh, is with Jew. She's a team leader within the water licensing branch for the Department for Environment and Water. Um, her team members are based in both Barrie and Murray Bridge. Um, she's been team leader for about 12 years. Uh, Frances and her team implement the water allocation plans for the 10 areas, including the River Murray prescribed water course. Francis is the chair of the Interoperability Group, an interjurisdictional group made up of members from New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, and the Murray-Darling Basin Authority. This group covers the operational River Murray interstate allocation and tag trade. Uh, Francis has in the past been a local council for the Loxton Waikiri District Council District for a period of 10 years, been a South Australian Murray-Darling Basin NRM board member for a six year term and been involved in the developing and operation and maintenance of the Croc and Sunderland's groundland, groundwater control scheme, uh, including the development of the legislation around that as well. So look, uh, you're bringing a wealth of experience to us, Francis, really grateful that you're able to join us and I will hand over to you and I've got your presentation up and running. So just let me know when you want me to move to the next slide. Thank you, Francis. Your turn. Thanks, Rod. Thanks, everyone, for all them coming along. Um, so, the River Murray prescribed water course is managed by the Water Licensing Team in Ferry, and the trading occurs via application forms, and the application forms that are uh, then are determined by the Minister's Delegate. Um, that's me at the moment, but there are other Minister's Delegates in the department. So. Uh, it can happen in other areas. Next slide, thanks. Um, some of the um, issues we come across on the application form are uh, making sure that we've got your details and for your company details correct at all times. 
study the condition on the water instrument that you do notify you of any changes of your contact details uh, within 21 days, especially your mobile phone numbers and your email addresses. And um, this is extremely pertinent when you're doing trades because we are aiming to send your approved application um, advice out back to you via email. So you'll get a much quicker uh, turnaround time if you do have an email address and are able to use that. Um, in the contact uh, details, we'd really like you to include them on the application form uh, and that way um, if you maybe have your farm manager filling out the application form, then that's the person we can go back to to ask questions just to clarify uh, the volume or uh, the correct licence number or account number. So it's just a, um, a handy hint that might save a bit of time in the application processing. Next, thanks, Stuart, or Rod says. Um, signing the applications. Again, um, this is where some applications are held up. So if there are two or more parties or names on the water instrument, then you all need to sign the application form. That is, unless you have an authority that's already been provided to you or your the water broker if you're using a water broker. But remember, two or more parties' names also would have to be on signed on the authority, and that is then matched up with what's in the water licensing system and the application can proceed. The same with a um, your name. Water instrument in the name of the company. Again, you need two signatories, either two company directors or the company secretary or director. And if you have a sole directorship, you really need to let us know that you're the sole director so that we don't then go back to you and ask for the second person to, to sign. Uh, quite often, customers get a bit annoyed if we do that, and uh, we're actually there to help not not annoy you, so if we get the right information in the first place, should save everyone a bit of uh, time and less headache. Uh, next slide, then. So on the application form, if you are the seller of the allocation, whether it's permanent entitlement or an allocation, we will need a current meter read from you and that's that entered into the water licensing system to make sure you do have enough water to trade. And again, that um, quickens the process if you actually put it on the application in the first place. We've got it ready to go and we won't have to come back to you. Uh, I've also just noted for your information that uh, quarterly and annual meter fees are to be taken in the first 14 calendar days of the appropriate months that are listed there, and supplied to the department. Um, and just to note that non-supply of a meter read may result in an expiation notice being issued to you, and the current fine of uh, of that thousand dollars was um, less than that last year, but we have new legislation, so it's thousand dollars plus the victim of crime uh, dollars, which is around $60. So it's quite a hefty uh, impost if you don't supply a metre read. And there are quite a lot of options to provide your metre read, um, either online, phoning in or emailing. And if you have any problems, just um, give us a call and we'll, we'll help you through that. But uh, really important if you're lodging an application that we do get that current meter read. Thank you, next slide. Just touch on interstate applications. So Stuart touched on a little bit of this already, which was excellent. But just remember, South Australia works in kilolitres. All the other states in Australia work in megalitres. So when you're filling in South Australia's paperwork, you need to remember to put it down in kilolitres, or if you write megalitres, you might get a phone call just to clarify, but um, 
we do match it up with the interstate paperwork as well. The trade is only to one decimal, so you can't have 18,999 kilolitres. It needs to be 18,000 kilolitres or 1.8 megalitres, if that's how you're thinking. If you use a duplicate interstate reference number, the application will be refused. We have a system um, that um, talks to the other state. Uh, that is called interoperability. And if the number has already been used, the, the, the system cannot match. So always make sure you have an unused duplicate and unused reference number. Don't use a duplicate. If the trade, unfortunately for you, is refused, you will be advised of the reason. And Stuart already touched on the, the reason it could be that the Barma Choke IBT is um, closed so that the trade doesn't come through. And you really must remember to lodge your paperwork in both states. Sometimes customers lodge in South Australia. Uh, and so if you get to lodge in either New South Wales or Victoria, and then they're ringing up each, each state and saying, where's my trade? I haven't done it yet. So just a handy hint to do that. If you use a water broker, they will do that for you. But if you're doing it yourself, just remember it's two lots of paperwork and fees. Next slide, thank you. Trade and quarterly accounting. So quarterly accounting was introduced at the beginning of last year and to ensure that your trade is considered in each quarter, uh, you really need to make sure that you have lodged your application before five o'clock on the last day of the relevant quarter. So if you want the trade to be relevant for quarter one, you need to, to submit it by 5pm on the 30th of September, and then it will be included into the calculation of balancing that order account. We might not have it completed uh, in the system, but as long as we have got it in the very office and we've stamped it that it's been received at relevant time, the calculation will be including that volume of water that you wanted to trade. Next slide, thank you. Uh, just a hint uh, for you. Uh, some account holders uh, liaise with their water brokers to uh, ensure that their quarter's accounts are balanced. They do this, they pay for the water, but they uh, omit to tell the broker that this must be done for a particular quarter so that their account is in a balanced situation. Um, so if it's not lodged by your broker, then again, you'll end up being in penalty. So just let your broker know if it's needed for the balancing of that particular water account uh, period. And then I'm sure they'll work with you and get it lodged in the in the time frame. The so quarterly accounting being a new introduction um, just takes a while for some people to get used to. So we'll again work with you where we can to help you through those those some minor issues that come up. Next slide, thank you. A peak period for for the year. I've touched on the quarterly accounting already. There will be a message displayed on the Environment and Water Connect website. So this is just a heads up for the end of the year. So guaranteed uh, processing and determining of your application will occur if the trade is lodged uh, by the 18th of June 2021. If you lodge it after that time, we will, do, we will endeavour to do our best to ensure your application is uh, determined, but we're not going to guarantee that it will be determined. So just try to be um, 
a bit smarter with the planning to make sure you get all the information through. And there is a slight um, issue with interstate lodging. Um, again, try and get it in by the, the 18th of June. But if you're still lodging applications and you happen to lodge it on the last working day of the month, 30th of June, last working day of the year, we can't uh, get it into the system to get it matched with the interstate um, area if the application is not actually processed in the system by 11 o'clock on the 30th of June. Uh, it's out of our control. The, um, the trade areas um, close their water registers down and you know, if that happens, then your application is going to be refused and you'll need to uh, have hopefully a second option uh, up your slave. Uh, thank you. Next slide. The main current requirement for um, applications at the moment is making sure you have the value of the trade recorded on the application fee. This is mandatory, but if the value is zero, then at the moment you're required to put a reason down. So it could be the reason is it's a related party um, or a same business, and that's a perfectly reasonable uh, reason. But we do have a future requirement, and um, that's to, to um, make sure that the reason of all trades is recorded on application forms. Uh, again, it could be a related party trade, could be standard commercial, could be allocation trade as part of a share transfer. There will be a, a list that's been developed across all of the states, so that it's a standard list because there's a lot of people that uh, deal with all uh, interstate uh, states. So just be aware that that is coming your way as we've been dealing with with that in the fullness of time. Uh, the other current, sorry, future requirement or opportunity for you that is heading your way is South Australia is developing a new water uh, licensing system and there'll be an opportunity when that's developed for you to have a lot more control over your account. Um, probably be up and running um, for next water year, but it's something that you can look forward to because you'll be able to um, have a user password and go in and actually view your account without having to ring us up and, and have a look at that. So that's quite exciting news for you all. And next slide, thanks. This slide is really for your information. Um, we have to report with the Murray trade uh, on uh, the website, is the Water Connect website. Uh, so we did a little table just to show um, what kind of uh, remote trades we get in um, and whether we're meeting the time frames that um, are there. So interstate trade at the moment is 20 business days and we have our new world licensing system in place that um, processing time frame will reduce. We do actually currently get most of the state trade uh, completed within five business days. Um, so if states went up considerably um, in 1920, I think that was a bit to do with quarterly accounting, but at the end of the year, it certainly uh, was impacted by the carryover passing into New South Wales and Victoria. Um, interstate trade also um, went up um, in 1920. And again, that may be because of quarterly accounting, people trying to buy only the water they need within each uh, quarter to be in balance. Um, and entitlement trade, being a permanent trade, uh, has been fairly steady um, throughout the four years that you've got there. Uh, entitlement trade um, tends to go up a bit if there's um, a government opportunity like 
the um, previous coffee program where you could uh, apply to get some funding from the government if you gave gave up some of your entitlement. Next slide, thank you. So the application form for um, for the River Murray and all the other areas across the state can be found at these two sites. For River Murray, you have an opportunity to either lodge the application in a paper form or online. There's an online system you can click on and use. Um, and at the moment, you can also either scan and send your application paper form through on email. Um, and that's helping a lot of people out. The Water Licensing Team is there to help you, so please don't hesitate to to contact them. Uh, if you're doing your own applications and you just want them to be checked before you send them in, you're welcome to send them in to the web address, uh, sorry, the email address that's um, on the screen, and someone can check that, get back to you and tell you if you need to add any more information. And last slide, thank you. This is the most important one to birthday. Thank you for your time and uh, I have found the information of you. Thank you. So Francis, maybe stay online. That was really, really helpful and really interesting. And I think there's some really important messages for everyone in that, um, particularly around ensuring you're doing things in a timely way um, and it lodging things in a timely way so that you can get the outcome you're seeking. Um, and I think a number of the dates that you've put in there are, are really helpful reminders to everyone around dates and times when things need to be done by. Um, so thank you for, for putting that together. There is um, one question for you. Uh, someone has asked or said, hi Francis, wouldn't it be a good idea for South Australia to conform with the other states and use megalitres instead of kilolitres? I don't know if there's anything you can say or comment on on that side of things, because I, I, most people seem to be able to navigate it, but it can be a source of some confusion. Yeah, look, it's in the legislature at the moment, so that's why we use that. Uh, my staff are um, very adept at helping through people through that, and if people make a mistake, uh, they just need to give us a, a call and we'll work with them, but um, yes, it is. Is looked at, and I'm sure it will probably be part of the next review of the landscape act, which uh, will involve water. But I'm not sure that's uh, a year or two away. So, fingers crossed that might happen into the future. Now, I can't see any more questions on there. So, obviously, you've been very clear in your presentation. So, very well thank done. You and thank you so much. But please stay with us. We're now going to switch across to do to start the the panel session of. Mm -hmm. Um, this where Megan will first be talking and, and then myself. Uh, just bear with me a second and I'll get back to the other presentation. Continuing in the theme of really practical considerations, um, we're now going to hear from Megan Taylor, who's Water and Administration Manager with Renmark Irrigation Trust. Um, Megan's responsible for the Trust's business management team has extensive experience in water license compliance and water trading together with all aspects of administration. Uh, Megan joined the trust in 2006 and was appointed water and administration manager in July 2017. And Megan, I understand you're going to particularly focus on some of the considerations from the temp market perspective uh, when someone is operating within a trust or within the Renmark Irrigation Trust. So I'd like to welcome you now, Megan, maybe if you could uh, unmute and turn your video on um, and I'll hand over to you to start with. Hi, uh, thanks for that, Rod. Uh, yes, yeah, so I will be focusing more on the uh, temp side of the uh, market, um, in particular, some of the biggest questions and concerns that we have from our customers. Um, so we have a diverse range of uh, customers, so we get a diverse range of uh, questions. Um, however, in particular, the most common one, of course, is um, around the market, about the price of water, uh, where the market's going, um, if it's going to go up or down, 
when's the best time to um, buy or sell? Um, so we get so many of those questions from our customer because so many of our customers uh, rely just on the spot market, which is one of the disadvantages um, in that. So um, as Stuart discussed earlier about the entitlement leasing and you know, forward leasing or parking, you know, there's um, some advantages with uh, using those products that um, have an advantage because they are uh, you know, not subject to the spot market where it's you know, quite volatile. Um, so there are some advantages of using those, those products. Um, in particular, if you're within an IIO, um, there are some advantages there because you don't have to um, enter into these products on your own. We have uh, a number of customers who actually um, band together um, and group and access these products as one entity. Because um, often, you know, we don't have um, a real lot of large irrigators. So maybe they only want 50 to um, 100 megs. So there aren't always these uh, products available, you know, in these smaller sizes. So, you know, an advantage of being within an um, infrastructure operator is that you can group with some of your um, fellow irrigators um, and access these, these products that Stuart discussed, discussed earlier. So, you know, we have another number of customers that um, do that, which will help, you know, um, with the volatility of the um, spot market. If you, um, you know, inquire about these products, um, speak to your brokers um, and, your, and your fellow irrigators to see if, you know, any of these uh, options uh, for you to use. And of course, you can work with your um, infrastructure operator to find out what the best option that we can help you work out or um, maybe even group you with some other, other customers. Um, of course, there is um, trading that you can do, you know, within your, within your trust um, or your, your operator. Um, so you don't have to just rely just on the stock market and brokers. You can do um, um, trading in, internally as well. Um, so in terms of the um, market, this, the last couple of years, um, the carryover policy has, um, has created um, a bit of concern. Um, so, you know, one of the biggest uh, questions we get um, for the last two years about is about what to do with your uh, remaining water. Uh, so rather than just having a volume of water left at the end of the year, um, irrigators are now, um, you know, having to decide about whether they want to uh, lease it out or save it for, for carryover. Um, of course, if they save it for carryover, they um, do run the risk of um, potentially losing it, depending on how, how allocations go in the next um, year. So, I mean, this year it's 77%, so we're hoping that it's going to get to 100%. 100%. Um, anybody that saved carryover uh, from last year, it's it's kind of like um, Schrodinger's cat. You don't really know whether you have access to that carryover until um, April when the minister makes his next announcement. Um, and that, you know, is a source of great concern for our, um, our customers. Uh, obviously, they want um, the full economic right of their, of their water. Um, so it affects, you know, when they go into the market. Um, there too. So the trust is actually been advocating for a more workable um, carryover policy because our customers come in, we hear their concerns. So um, it's something that we've been working on and um, would value um, support there with, um, you know, improving that for our for our irrigators. So um, yeah, that are a couple of the biggest biggest concerns um, that we have in terms of um, trading um, within the within the market um, and yeah, there's, there's options. So um, if you're um, looking at sell, um, leasing allocation, you know, speak to your infrastructure operator um, and find out, you know, what options are best, best for you. We're here to help your brokers here to, there to help you as well. Um, so yeah, thanks Rod. Thanks Megan, look, that, that's really helpful and, and really interesting about how uh, I guess irrigators are coming together to bundle a transaction and, and get a transaction done at their scale, given many of them are smaller. Um, yes. That's really, you know, that's great that people are working together like that to achieve that and the trust is able to help them um, in doing that. Um, and look, I think it's interesting how people are, and I think that's a key reason this literacy series is being done is around issues like carryover risk 
um, and what are your other options yeah. available to you around this? Because um, the South Australian allocations are, are very reliable. Um, yes. And so they, you know, they bring, you know, the 20% the, the is fantastic. And, and a few months ago, we were uncertain. I expect many of the Uruguays were quite uncertain as to how much they were going to be getting this year. And so the carryover was quite useful to ensure they at least had that in their account plus whatever allocation. But a new question emerges, is clearly emerging now around yeah. um, the allocation side of things. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit now and um, keep your video on, but maybe I'll ask you to go on mute briefly, Megan, and then we'll bring everyone back together for uh, to go through some of these questions that have come through as part of the session. Um, or you can turn your video off if you want to, I don't mind either way. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about the permanent side of things and some of the considerations. So it was interesting when I was preparing for this session, I had a few, made a few inquiries um, uh, to just understand some of the key issues and opportunities being faced by participants in the water market. And two key issues emerged that I want to talk about briefly um, that are still occasionally tripping some up. Um, the first one is around what's the difference between wet and dry. And people have been in the market for years. They go, oh, I understand that. Um, that's all okay. Um, but for new people, new participants in the market, wet and dry is a terminology they might not have come across before. So first of all, dry relates to a permanent trade for water where the allocation doesn't transfer with the trade because it might have been used, might have already been sold to another party. Whereas wet uh, is basically, the convention usually is that the trade includes the full announced allocation for the water year. Um, but it's always important to check if that's the case um, to confirm how much allocation is coming with the entitlement trade. Um, so why is this important? Well, wet trades are generally and understandably more expensive than dry trades and the differential in the price is often reflected in what you can see in the temporary market in terms of their prices um, because they come with the value of that allocation attached. Obviously, if there's, you make a transaction, you purchase permanent water, you get the next allocation announcements on it, come what may. But if you've already got the announced allocation, that value is coming to you as well. Um, and if you as a buyer want all the water this season, this can become, this can be really important to you. Um, because if it's a dry trade, then you're obviously got to be looking at what could be announced in terms of uh, allocation going forward that water year. But it may also mean that you need to step into the temporary market uh, to access some more water. The second issue that emerged was around delivery shares and delivery rights. And Megan, you probably will have some insights into this as well, I expect. But um, first of all, what is a delivery right or a share? Now, I acknowledge that this is particularly an issue uh, in the context of irrigation infrastructure operators, such as CIT, Central Irrigation Trust, or Renmark Irrigation Trust. But a delivery Water delivery right or water delivery share, um, both terms tend to be used, uh, represents an irrigator's share in the capacity of a trust's pumping and pipeline infrastructure. Um, and these delivery rights are a key component of the unbundling of water rights and designed really to provide flexibility for irrigators to manage them separately from their irrigation rights. Um, water delivery shares are issued by the irrigation infrastructure operator on a volume or megalitre basis. They're allocated to an owner of an irrigation outlet associated with a defined parcel of land, but they can be transferred. Um, but that transfer needs to be with the approval of the irrigation infrastructure operator. And critically, the transfer must be hydrologically possible. So it's really important that if you're thinking about a transaction that the check is done on the delivery shares. But why is this a key issue and, and why has this become a problem? Well, it was interesting the sort of issues that emerged in the discussions that I had. 
Um, so one of the challenges here is that delivery rights actually can be an asset or a liability. And it really varies on a case by case basis. Um, so it's really important that if you're a seller and you're selling an entitlement that has and delivery rights, um, that you take this into consideration. And because there are termination cost risks, if the buyer doesn't want the delivery shares, um, and this can reflect a significant transactional cost. And there were some examples that people pointed to where the seller hadn't realised that they actually had a cost um, with this and they hadn't really done the checks on this side of things. So what's involved? Well, should a uh, holder no longer wish to retain some or all of their delivery rights? They can be transferred to another person or they can be terminated by the trust. But there are termination considerations there and both Renmark and Irrigation and Central Irrigation Trust um, have a termination fee attached to the ward delivery rights, which is 10 times the annual service charge, which I guess in the in the context of the trust can amount to hundreds of dollars. Well, I'm aware it adds, adds up to hundreds of dollars per megalitre of water delivery right. So it's really important that when you're participating in these parts of the market, that you've done your research on delivery shares. And that equally applies to buyers and sellers. What, what, what's coming with this transaction or what's uh, moving off their account with this transaction? Um, you need to ensure that you're really clear on the contextual arrangements because you're going to need this information when you get to completing the transfer forms. Um, and obviously also you need to also keep an eye out for encumbrances um, as part of the process as Stuart spoke about previously in terms of risks. Um, but it has emerged uh, and it was interesting that it did emerge in some of the, the questions that I was asking people across um, South Australia as, as a recurring issue where one or other party, either the buyer or the seller, um, has periodically got a bit of a surprise in this area around water delivery rights and um, whether the contract was clear or silent on these issues um, is, is a really important consideration. Megan, if I can turn to you on delivery rights, you spoke particularly about temporary market considerations, but I wondered if you have any comments on, on the permanent side of things as well, and whether you witness these sorts of uh, issues in your role with Renmark Irrigation Trust. And you're on, I'll get you to unmute and turn your screen back on. <laughs> That's okay, Megan. <laughs> Sorry, Rod, yeah. Uh, yeah, so within our um, trust, we don't have a real lot of issues in terms of um, delivery rights, in particular terminating the delivery rights. Um, it is, it is quite, quite, quite low. Um, most of our um, members uh, do, do try and come in and see us before they, they um, sell their water um, in entitlements so that they um, are aware of the of the rules, um, you know, and then there's, you know, once they sell their entitlement, there's still ongoing um, delivery right charges um, that still that still um, occur. Um, yeah. Well, that's really pleasing. That's a good outcome for, for, for your trust. It's obviously some of what I was hearing must be in the context of others. So, but look, it's just a reminder to all to really talk to the trust if you're looking to do this sort of transaction. Now, we're looking to move to a bit of a broader um, Q&A discussion now. And I, I note there is a fair list of questions that have been captured as part of the process. Um, and um, I'm now suggesting that we bring back some of the other speakers. So, um, Francis and Stuart, if you also want to come back in, um, I think we can start working through 
some of these questions and Simo, you've joined us as well. Fantastic. Great. Sorry. Um, so looking through some of the questions, I might just um, throw some questions to different um, people uh, across those that have come in thus far. And maybe I'll start with one for you, Megan, if that's okay. Um, yep. Someone's come in and said, what's the difference in trading within an IIO as compared to working with a broker? So I presume the question is around, how does it differ between them working with you guys or with a broker? Yeah. I mean, the obviously uh, obvious difference is that when you um, go through your um, IIO, um, trade through them, then there isn't a broker. Um, so you deal direct, direct with, um, with your op operator. Um, in terms of when you go through uh, a broker, um, you still have to deal with your infrastructure operator. Um, so rather your broker will deal with your, um, your operator. So it's um, whatever um, terms and conditions your infrastructure operator have will still be applicable whether you go through an infrastructure operator, your operator or whether you go through a broker. Um, the main difference will be that your dealings with going through a broker will be through the broker. Um, and then they will deal direct with the operator because obviously your operator is still involved because the water still needs to come off of your account. Um, your operator will be the main uh, license holder. Uh, so they will still need to do that. So there, there will still be the um, involvement of the two parties there. Um, and if you just go through your infrastructure operator, you deal direct um, with them and whatever terms and conditions um, they have within terms of um, trading. There are some advantages and disadvantages of going um, through your operator um, uh, as opposed to a broker. Um, sometimes the cost can be reduced. Obviously, you won't have um, brokerage costs um, with a broker, uh, but that depends on your on your operator. They may have may have a have a charge um, for that, but it's generally um, less than what you would pay through a broker. Um, a disadvantage though sometimes with your operator is that there is um, less of a market. So if you're looking to um, do a quick trade, it may not, may not happen as fast as if you went through, through a broker um, who has the whole, whole market out there that they can um, interact with to try and buy or sell you entitlement or allocation. Um, so there are a couple of the, um, the differences. Um, Great. So, yeah. Thank you, Megan. No, that's excellent. Um, now, just a reminder that if you want to ask a question as a participant, um, we've got a few that we've got to work through here, but if you'd really also like to just ask the question live, if you raise your hand, we can unmute you so you can ask the question of the panel directly if you'd prefer. Um, I've got another question here, and I, I think I might direct this one at you, Simo. Um, what's the range of commissions charged by brokers in relation to the volume of temporary water traded per transaction. And I'll hand that one to you, Simon. Yes, so uh, these commissions, they vary in a couple of different ways in the water market. For instance, some intermediaries, uh, they charge both sides, i.e. the buyer and the seller whereas some only uh, charge commission on one side. Typically it's, it's seller only in these cases. There's also uh, a difference in terms of whether the brokers charge a, uh, a fixed dollar per megaliter fee uh, for, for temp trades, or if it's a uh, percentage commission of the trade value. Uh, and in the latter case, typically, the commissions uh, we've witnessed in the market over the years, they've been between 0.5 to 3% of, of the trade value. Uh, typically when, when market prices are higher, uh, the intermediaries tend to lower their commissions. Uh, for instance, last year when temporary water was trading uh, at you know, $1,000 per megaliter, charging a 3% uh, commission on that would be you know, a fair additional cost to that. So they have a bit of a uh, wiggle room there to adjust their, their fees. Uh, but yeah, we encourage people to talk 
to uh, multiple uh, brokers to, to shop around and then perhaps get the best deal uh, that suits your requirements. But yeah, there's a fair bit of variability in these uh, commissions that the brokers charge. So it's really important that you do your homework, isn't it? Yes. As part of the exercise and, and ask that question. I'm going to take a question now if that's okay. So someone has emailed, has messaged in and said, in relation to delivery rights, um, can we comment on the fact that in some irrigation areas, the rights have a value um, and vendors are paid for them rather than being a liability? And um, certainly can. And I think it's, it's a really important point and a really important question um, to ask because we are observing in a number of IIOs in, in certain circumstances where there is um, some form of, you know, there's a high level of water usage in that area. And so there's a hydrological constraint in that part of the system that the delivery rights are accruing um, a value. It's not universally the case everywhere, but there are certainly circumstances where delivery rights are not a, a liability, but actually are an asset in that circumstance. Um, so it certainly can work both ways, that they can be a liability or an asset, um, but it's really important that you're, you're aware of whether it is or isn't a, an asset moving into the transaction so that you're your eyes wide open to that. Um, I've got a question here on what's the likelihood of the April 15 allocation forward announcement being greater than 50% based on historical inflow data. Um, really, that's a, a crystal ball exercise, but I wondered, Simo, are you able to comment at all on that one as well? Or is that one, Stuart, you want to comment on? Yeah, I can comment on that. Yeah, as you said, Rod, it's, it's a bit of a crystal ball territory. Uh, but obviously, there are some uh, things we can learn from the history, like in general, uh, the access to SA carryover has been very infrequent. So it's only during the very dry years when it's flagged that uh, it uh, may be available for use, like as happened last April. Uh, I think the last time before that was uh, uh, a few years ago. Uh, um, 2016, 17 from memory. Uh, but yeah, like uh, it, it depends on so many things like uh, the um, future inflows for, for this season. Uh, also, what's the, uh, what are the volumes shared between the three states in the shared MDBA storages, uh, the SAS entitlement flow, uh, you know, uh, stuff like that. So really hard to predict. Uh, but yeah, historically speaking, um, yeah, access to SA carryover uh, has only been uh, made available during very dry years. Thanks, Simo. Um, maybe a question for you, Stuart, now. So um, someone's picked up from this, obviously, that there is risks associated with carryover. And the, the comment that's come through was, so effectively that real water that has a real value is ultimately lost to the irrigator who may have invested to manage upcoming risk. Hence, not much better to carry over an S over and to park it on a low security water license that's unlikely to ever spill. Um, might be a better consideration seems to be the, the point being made. So Stuart? Um, yeah, um, potentially, I, I think um, it's about people understanding the options that they have available to them and the associated risks. Um, I guess if you're parking in a low security VIC such as Goulburn, then not just the spill, but you're also gonna need to worry about the trade restrictions and getting it back into your account. So I think that the, as we've discussed, the purpose of these uh, is it, of, of the, the workshops is to ensure people are informed as possible to make the best trading decision and to, and to look into state and to see what all your options are um, and to see and to see whether it, you know, a low reliability in gold might be the best. You just might need to get the water out um, at a certain period of time and there is information out there so you can see when these trade um, restrictions are open and when they're shut. So 
Um, yep. While you've got the floor, Stuart, um, and look, I, yeah, it's it's around finding the right opportunity and being really mindful of the risks that present, isn't it? Um, there's a question in here around what's the best place to find information on water trading, which is a pretty open and broad question, but I think it's, you know, it's a good one to, to think about the various places that um, someone who's thinking about doing trading could actually, where, where are some of the key sources they might want to turn to, to, to inform themselves and what are some of the products that are out there? Definitely. Um, well, I'll start with the Cursor uh, Water Market Literacy Program that we're currently doing. We've done two webinars and workshops before that um, are up and available and we've covered um, water market fundamentals and we've covered secondary um, different secondary products um, such as parking and carryover and our leases um, and so that would be my first um, stop. Um, certainly Jew has a range of information and, and also the trusts um, have a range of fact sheets on there. Um, as indicated we're in, in, not, not immediately but um, in the coming week the, the fact sheets uh, for these webinars will be um, available. Um, and also um, uh, Marston Jacobs Water Flow, um, which we gave a presentation uh, and, and a demonstration in the first um, webinar and a video is available as part of this work, um, personal workshop uh, that will take you through and show you, you know, all the, the current prices, the trading, um, the connectivity, um, and that's a, another really good resource. Thanks, Stuart. Um, I'm actually going to address this next question, if I can, to you and also to Francis, because there's a couple of considerations in this. Um, so it's around parking water interstate. And the question is, when's the best time to park water? What are the costs involved? And, and I guess, um, Stuart, if you wanted to jump in, I'd, you know, I'd be interested uh, your thoughts on when's the best time to be thinking about parking water is now a good time or not. But uh, I think the other consideration is in doing that sort of process that we need to be very mindful. And this is, Francis, we're a great opportunity to remind people of some of the timelines they need to adhere to when they're thinking about parking water um, around, um, particularly if there's an interstate consideration to it. But Stuart, did you wanna go first? And then maybe Francis, if you go second? Yeah, certainly. Um, I think it, it really depends on the product. I guess here we're talking about um, parking interstate and the best time to park water. And I guess the purpose of parking is to utilise the characteristics of those entitlements in the other states that have um, that enable you to, to carry over. And so that would be over the water year and having um, a certainty of an amount in the at the beginning of the next water year. So typically carryover starts to, you know, to become available um, around the end of quarter four in the water year. Um, we certainly saw last year a lot of carryover um, occurring up to uh, indications about 600 gigalitres was carry over in the Southern Connected. So it was a, a very used product and at times there was no space available in some of those um, more accessible zones. Um, so the, the, yeah. Simo, if you've got any. Yeah, if I can jump in just to yeah, continue on that. That's exactly right, Stuart. And yeah, for parking, it's it's only really topical during the uh, second half of the year. And, you know, if there are any water brokers in the audience, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, you would hardly ever see a, a carryover parking trade going through during the first six months of the season because not many people are willing to commit to, to offering, you know, uh, carryover space on their entitlement because they are not really in a position to assess how much they would have available, you know, heading towards the tail end of the season. So it's, yeah, it's very, you know, uh, the, uh, the high season for parking is typically the last quarter of, of the year. But obviously you, you, there is a longer term solution. Like if, if you want to secure some, uh, carry over space in the state, you might consider leasing a, a low reliability entitlement you know, for a longer term. And it, this happens, you know, it's, it's not the most 
I suppose, liquid lease market, but um, it, it does happen. So, you know, and the prices are somewhat in line with the annual parking uh, uh, fees. So, you know, there, there may be parcels available for you to, to, to lease low reliability water in Victoria for three to five years, and that will give you additional carryover capacity for, for the term of, of that lease. Francis, from your perspective? Yes, definitely. Um, it would only happen in the second half of the year. Um, I think people this year really did it in the last two weeks of June. So that's probably when most of the parking of carryover occurs. Definitely take the opportunity to remind people that they must have their trade logs before 11 o'clock on the 30th of June. And another little uh, item to factor into that carryover is to make sure you read your meter and take into account the new water you've used since your last meter read because uh, you will trade what's available on your account but if you haven't factored in the last amount of use then you may go into an overuse situation which incurs a penalty so there's two factors that people need to consider with that. No, very important reminder. You've got to have always got to be mindful of that as well. See, my building on what you were just saying then, there's a question here. Can I buy water parking space interstate and what is the cost? Um, it's not really a uniform cost situation here, but I wondered if you were able to sort of talk about some of the experience that we're witnessing in different parts. Yeah, sure, Rod. And... Uh... A reminder, in the last webinar, we actually had some uh, case study examples of, of parking water and what's the cost uh, involved in that uh, under uh, some specific scenarios. But yeah, you know, um, it depends on the location uh, to begin with. You know, if, if you're in the Murray, uh, then as we've touched on uh, previously, uh, finding parking space in a state in the Murray so that you can safely get that water returned to you in the new season. Uh, those uh, parking parcels were very much in high demand last year and the prices uh, because of the higher demand were, were higher. So we've witnessed prices, you know, up to 50, $60 per megaliter parking uh, water in the Murray on a low reliability in Thailand, for instance, in Victoria where the risk of spill is minimal. Then in the Goulburn, you could find more affordable parking space, but as we've touched on many a time during this workshop, there is a risk of getting that water back because of the IVT. Uh, Marumbichi, uh, a lot of water was parked in the Marumbichi as well, and this was uh, evident uh, uh, looking at the, the uh, transactions in the new water year uh, that caused the Marumbichi IVT out trade to be closed because water was parked in Marumbichi and it was traded out. So now you actually can't get water out of Marumbichi. So the cost, it depends on the risk of spill uh, characteristic of the entitlement, but also the location. And, and broadly speaking, we're talking about a cost between five to $60 per megaliter on, on an average year. But it, yeah, it depends on a couple of different things. And I wonder, just building on, Francis's comments there, Megan, if there's anything else that someone should be mindful of if they're doing something like um, temp parking arrangement or the like, and they're within an IIO um, around processes and timing considerations and these sorts of things that you'd like to um, share with the group. Yeah, so if you're um, looking at transferring, ferrying um, or parking parking water um, and you're within an operator, then you obviously have to factor in the delays that might happen um, in terms of your operator processing um, your trade. They have to, you know, check that you have the, uh, the available water um, and get make sure they have the, your, your approval, approval to do that. Um, sometimes it can, can create delays because there is, a, you know, an extra party involved um, with doing that. Um, it is, you know, best if you use a broker um, 
to do to do those um, types of types of trades. Um, they uh, uh, ensure that you know it's done in a timely manner to the right to the right licenses um, through the right balance and, and all that. So yes, you just have to factor in that that extra extra time. Um, so you know you don't want to leave it too late when you do these these trades um, to fit into the timeline. So early engagement with the IIO is important. Early engagement with the respective departments is important. And if you're dealing interstate, be mindful as well of the cutoffs interstate as well. And I think there's some excellent information in what you've put together, Francis, for us. But I, I, from what I'm hearing, Megan, um, a few days in advance of that at the least as well is always helpful, particularly when you're uh, going through peak transactional periods as well and you know with much of this occurring in that final quarter and even the final month or months um, there can be significant peaks uh, in the workload at that stage which you know, everyone obviously does their absolute best to get everything done in time but um, th there are challenges there and forms have to be submitted. Um, I think we've only got time for one more um, and this is I guess a, a pretty broad question. I wonder if any of the guys in the panel want to have a chat about or want to comment on it, but um, are there, the question says, referring back to comments about outlooks, does the panel have any comment about the trade constraints currently in place and the amount of water in the lower Murray, namely SA Vic and New South Wales through the 2020 season? Um, which is a really important and good question. I wondered, Simo, you've had a little bit of a look into this um, in recent times as a steward. Did you, did you want to open in terms of responding to that? Can do. Yeah, thanks, Rod. Uh, yeah, in, in the first, in, in the April webinar, uh, when the first sort of outlooks for the, for the uh, 2021 season were coming in, we looked into this and had a, a presentation slide about, you know, how much water uh, is potentially made available in the Lower Murray, assuming all the major trade limits uh, restrict water coming into the Lower Murray. So say being the, the Bama Chok being closed for the full year, the Golden IVT being closed for the full year, and the Murrumbidgee IVT out trade being closed for the full year. And at that point uh, in time, the outlook was pretty grim, you know, it, it, uh, under the worst case scenario where you can't get water from other parts of the connected system into the Lower Murray. So, but now, you know, the, the resource availability uh, outlook has significantly improved and also the opening allocations have been fairly encouraging uh, across the board, really. So obviously still, uh, if all these uh, three main trade limits uh, remain closed for the uh, entire year, sure, you know, water will be in high demand in the Lower Murray uh, if, if it's dry. But yeah, I think the uh, improved outlook is offsetting uh, the current trade restrictions uh, to a point. Does anyone else want to comment on that side of things or is, nope. Um, look, I, I agree exactly with what, what you're saying, Simo. Thankfully, the, the improved outlook is, is offsetting those sort of things. I, I think the important message though, always from a SA context is that um, it's always important to look at those zones for mine where there isn't um, restrictions and you are beneficially placed in the context of zones both in Victoria and New South Wales, where no restrictions come into play. Um, and, and I personally would suggest starting in those. And then um, if you are thinking about doing a transaction that is uh, either into the Murrumbidgee, the Goulburn or above Barmachoke, um, that there are uh, very good information resources out there in terms of where the uh, limits are at at this point in time, and it's well worth having a look into the status of those. We do on Waterflow record um, the status of those limits, but I'd also you know, encourage you to go and have a look at what's on the relevant state or MDBA websites for that sort of information. 
Stuart, did you want to comment further on that, or should we um, bring this to a close? Uh, I think that's covered. I was, I was going to mention the MDBA and some of the reasons for moving water, you know, the underlying architecture of actually moving water from, say, using the storages in the Goulburn to transfer water out can you know, at times change those trade restrictions quite quickly. So, you know, having notifications or something set up so you can get those alerts um, and be on top of when they're available because they're usually um, pretty uh, hot property to get your trades through. So look, we're right on time. So I think I'll draw this to a close now. First of all, I'd like to uh, pass on our sincere thanks to Francis and Megan for your contributions today. Really grateful for your contributions, um, really insightful comments and really helpful comments for everyone um, in, involved in the webinar. Um, I'd also like to um, thank my colleagues, Stuart, Simo and Amanda, who you can't see in the background, but who's the person who's made all of this happen technologically. She's doing an awesome job there. Um, and also thanks to the guys at PERSA, um, Rachel and Tasha, for all the time and contribution they've made. Um, following the webinar, you'll be directed to a survey. Um, it'll only take you a couple of minutes, but it is really helpful to us in terms of getting your feedback on what the matters that we've covered today, whether there's other topics that you feel would be great to cover, um, and how the, the webinar went as a whole. Um, and with that, I'd like to wish you all a very uh, happy afternoon, and I hope you're all staying well and safe in these uncertain times. All the very best, and thank you so much for joining us today.